Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vitobiomes Alliance webinar series. Um, we have a great webinar scheduled for you today, and we're just going to pause for a moment. We still have some participants who are entering, but I did want to um, welcome you all. We're glad that you're with us today. And just a couple of an announcements um, that um, we will be uh, utilizing the question and answer panel. So if you have um, questions, which we know you will, we just encourage you to use that Q&A panel today instead of the chat. Um, you will see messages pop up in the chat um, by our organizers today, and they will be sharing with you um, the necessary information about the webinar and any links um, that will be provided during the presentation. So once again, welcome, and uh, let's just all pause for just a moment to remember the significance of this day. Um, you know, 20, 20 plus years ago, um, the United States um, experienced a horrific tragedy. And so let's just uh, all remember um, those that were impacted by um, this day, uh, September 11th. And welcome everyone again who has joined. Uh, my name is Dusty Gallagher. I am the Executive Director of the Phytobiomes Alliance. And we welcome you to the webinar series today. We have a wonderful webinar. Um, but to begin, I'd like to just uh, give a, a brief reminder about the Phytobiomes Alliance. Um, we are a nonprofit consortium of industry, academic, and governmental scientists. So we uh, are very welcoming um, in terms of, of who can participate. Um, and uh, we would not be able to do what we do in terms of these webinars and other activities and projects without the generous um, sponsors that you see here on your screen. So thank you to those of you who continue to sponsor the Alliance and our activities. So just as a reminder, um, you know, sometimes we often mistake the microbiome and the phytobiome. Um, so we'd like to just remind everybody what we mean when we use the term phytobiomes. It's a complex systems of plant-based agriculture. So we begin with plants in a particular substrate, soil or any other type. And then we also consider all of the um, microorganisms, macroorganisms, uh, animals and plants that impact uh, the biome. We also consider the climate, the weather, the water that's available to the plant in this environment. And then all of this is influenced by management practices. So what we do at the Phytobiomes Alliance is we identify the gaps between all of these components to try to understand better the systems approach to growing that food, feed, and fiber that is so important and energy that is so important to all of us. So just a few examples of phytobiomes. We most often think about um, soil um, in a field with traditional agriculture, but it also includes uh, other non-traditional elements, uh, whether that be container farming, vertical farming, hydroponic systems, or even forests and, ag and, and animals um, in pasture. So all of these are examples of phytobiomes. And the vision of our organization is that all farmers will eventually have the ability to use predictive uh, measures and analytics uh, based on a number of different factors to be able to make the best decisions possible for the best combination of crops, management practices, inputs for a specific field or a specific biome in a specific year. So really understanding the system so the farmers have all of the tools at their fingertips. So um, one of the major events of the, uh, that we do at the Phytobiomes is we have a international Phytobiomes conference every two years. And um, our next um, iteration of this conference is coming up in November in St. Louis. And we have a, a very important deadline upcoming this Friday, September 13th, is the deadline for early bird registration, early career award applications, and abstracts. 
uh, submissions for oral presentations and flash talks. So we encourage all of you um, to take a look um, at the uh, schedule for the conference and uh, submit those abstracts by this Friday. We also have some additional upcoming events um, that um, we will be hosting. Um, in conjunction with that International Phytobiomes Conference in November, we will be hosting a pre-conference workshop, which is just the day preceding the conference. And that will be organized by the U.S. Culture Collections Network, which is a project of the Alliance. And so we will be exploring the value of microbial germplasm for research and industry. So we have that the day before the conference. We have the conference in November. We will have another webinar this December, and more information will be uh, forthcoming very soon. And then in January, we will be uh, organizing two workshops at the Plant and Animal Genome Conference in San Diego um, in mid-January. So please put those on your calendar, um, and we'd love to have you participate. So just a few additional reminders um, that our webinar is recorded and will be posted on the Phytobombs Alliance YouTube channels later today. Um, and we will have a presentation by our guests today, and then we will have opportunity for a Q&A and a discussion. So please remember to use that Q&A box, which is at, uh, in your control panel of Zoom. It's probably at the bottom of your screen toward the right. There's a big question mark. Um, that identifies the Q&A panel. So we would like you to use that um, and, and, and refrain from using the, the chat function to enter your questions. The chat will be used for messages from the organizers to all of your participants. And then there's also a handout section which we will um, have PDFs of the slides presented today and any other information um, from the presentation. And if you haven't already, um, please sign up for our mailing list. That's the best way to find out about all the Alliance um, events um, and activities that we do. So uh, let's get started today with our, our discussion. And we're very pleased to have Prasanna Kankanala. She's the director of R&D from Trace Genomics. And um, Trace and Prasanna have been a really uh, wonderful friend to the Phytobiomes Alliance. And today she will talk, be talking about the soil metagenome insights and emerging frontier in sustainable agriculture. So I welcome Prasanna um, to, this, to the screen. I'll invite her to share her slides and then we will uh, get going momentarily. Prasanna, welcome to our web webinar. Thank you, Dusty. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, give me a quick minute while I share the slides. Now, yeah, let's see. Is that yes. working? Yes, that looks great. Perfect. Great. Uh, thank you, Dusty, once again, and thanks to the Phytobiome Alliance for uh, this uh, opportunity to present. The, this information today. And I think your introduction sets a perfect stage, Dusty, for this conversation and this presentation today because we, we talk about systems-based approach to really answer the questions that we have in our agricultural systems today. And that's what soil metagenomics and trace genomics is all about. So um, I'm going to start off, as we talk about soil metagenomics, you know, we're talking about We've evolved to the stage. What what has our journey been in in terms of agricultural systems? What are the challenges? The microbial the microbiology studies that has brought to this stage. So let's take that big bird's eye view first before we dig into the metagenomic insights. Um, you know, so that this puts everything into perspective. So if we just start off with you know our agro ecosystems that we're trying to work very hard to solve the problems of current agricultural times. If we start off with the pre-industrial times, it was a lot of subsistence farming, there was crop rotations, very labor intensive, of course, low productivity. Um, it was very rural farming and small farms. And as we moved into the times of industrial revolution, we went into mechanized farming, moved more into monocropping systems, that we increased our yields, 
But in that system, over time, what we realized is we were hurting the agriculture, uh, the environmental degradation, uh, you know, we started seeing some glimpses of that. And as we worked through this in our mid 90s came, you know, the green revolution followed by the biotech revolution, where we started breeding for high risk, high yielding varieties, the main goal being, you know, to reduce hunger globally, because that was a huge problem. And then over the times, you know, uh, moving all the way into almost our current times, we've started facing problems like water scarcity, loss of biodiversity, soil erosion became the problems, uh, you know, the post biotech revolution. So that brings us to our current times where we are constantly hearing about regenerative agriculture, sustainability, resilient systems and climate smart agricultures. And if you think about it, what you know, the current day challenges is not as much as productivity, um, but it is a lot about uh, water scarcity, degrading soils. And in a changing climate, we're talking about, you know, the changes in the patterns for pests and diseases, which is hitting our crop yields as well. So th these are the challenges that we have today that we need to address. And this is the agricultural system evolution uh, in a very broad overview. Now, all the decisions that are made, you know, for the inputs into the farm, uh, what we're going to do, how we're going to deal with the farming, they all come based on different kinds of tests. And, you know, I'll broadly categorize them as soil tests. You know, again, if we look at the evolution of this, started off with visual observations in pre-industrial times, you know, they look for earthworms, they look for yield, they look for, you know, the texture and the odor of the soil, the soil color, you know, to see, you know, how that correlates with their yield. Moving into industrial revolution, you know, when then we started advancing into science, it was a lot about pH, you know, lime applications, organic matter. And then we moved into the micros and the macros, formally integrated, uh, you know, uh, yield data, weather data, FMI systems in the 1980s. And today we're talking about precision agriculture, satellite imagery, um, in addition to all the chemistry in the some of the biology testing that we do, very preliminary biology testing. But if you take a look at the actionable insights, the key decision-making tool on the farm today, it is still yield, soil, physical, and chemical properties, okay? But we all know that the soil biology, the life of the soil is such an important and critical factor. And so um, if you need to move into a very sustainable agricultural system, we need to get very more, we need to get more holistic with our uh, understanding of the soil environment. And when I talk about holistic soil environment, what I'm essentially referring to is the physical properties, the chemical properties, and the biological features. And the biology becomes a very important component because the microbes in the soil essentially contribute to a lot of different functions we talk about, whether it's yield, you know, uh, water quality, carbon sequestration, nutrient use efficiency, biocontrol, all these properties are conferred by the uh, microbes in the soil. So if you look at the evolution of the microbiology itself, uh, again, a quick snapshot, a journey through time, you know, in the 90, in the 1860s and 1880s, around that time, you know, Formally, we started of microbiology um, at the time when we started to understand fermentation processes, pasteurization, you know, of course, the germ theory that Louis Pasteur had come up with. And around, and by the time the discovery, the invention of microscopes have happened, we learned, you know, these little tiny beings exist that make, uh, you know, that have a critical role to play. And then some of the major discoveries came through nitric, you know, we started understanding, um, Nitrogen fixation, you know, the rhizobial bacteria and legumes fix uh, atmospheric nitrogen. Then we learned about chemolithotrophy, the metabolic processes in microbes where that convert the inorganic matter and derive energy through those uh, molecules. And again, as, as we started learning more about the microbiology, you know, came the Green Revolution and in the Green Revolution time, it was heavily input based. Okay. And while we adopted this heavy chemical input, uh, you know, into our agricultural systems to, you know, to eradicate the global poverty, uh, global hunger issues that we were facing. Simultaneously, we advanced our knowledge about rhizobial fungi, and then we also started looking into the rhizosphere microbiome, identified plant growth promotion uh, microbes, 
And with this discovery and with this learning came in the era in the 1980s when the first biopesticides and biofungicides were, you know, uh, spoken about, they were brought out into the market. Of course, we're seeing not much adoption of those and we'll address that issue a little bit later. From there, moving into current times, the study of this microbiology has gone to the microbiome because we have understood it's no more about a single microbe or microbe-microbe interactions. There is a very complex interaction that's happening there and understanding this interaction is going to be critical for us to address the uh, issues in agriculture. So these are the beneficial microbes. If you look at, uh, you know, the major milestones in the plant pathology, you know, the biotic stress factors, again, you know, we started a formal birth of plant pathology, uh, 18th and early 19th century, again, discovery of um, uh, invention of microscopes, started looking at rust fungi and potato blights. And then based on that, we got a deeper understanding, started talking about chemical treatments in early 1900s with sulfur and copper-based chemicals, then eventually moved into plant breeding for disease resistance. Then we further uncovered virology and nematology. And around the time when we understood the rhizosphere microbiome, the plant growth promoting microbes, the integrated pest management came through and the biocontrol in the 1970s, and it continues. It, it's, it's been evolving since then. And moving into the present times, then we got into GM crops, molecular diagnostics came through. We're in the era of CRISPR-Cas and gene editing and microbiome for disease suppression. So if you look at the evolution, whether it is bio nutrient use efficiency or diseases, the study is all moving towards microbiome studies because it's that holistic environment we really need to understand those interactions. So, and the reason is because again, uh, in our modern day agricultural systems, if you look at some of the major challenges, if I were to list out, you know, we hear about the algal blooms, the blue baby syndrome because of the excessive fertilizer use, the way we are hurting our uh, environmental systems that is in turn also impacting human health, animal health. Um, inappropriate use of pesticides and herbicides. We're looking at all these herbicide resistant weeds, you know, evolution of pesticide resistance and environmental contaminations. Soil degradation. I think... Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, FAO had come up with its uh, figures. Globally, we're losing 24 billion tons of fertile soil, fertile soil per year. So we are in truly in the red zone and we need to really address these issues right now. And of course, climate change, not new to this audience. You know, agriculture, soils do contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. So if you look at one thing that's common amongst all of these things at you know, underlying factor here is it's microbes that play a role in every one of these functions. Whether we are talking about the nutrient use efficiency, is that fertilizer going to be plant available or will it go into greenhouse gas emission or will it leach into our water systems? The biocontrol nature of the soils, carbon sequestration, all of these features are essentially controlled by the microbiome in the soil. And that is where you know, the study of this microbiome and integrating this knowledge into decision making at the farm gate is going to be important for us to bring resilience into our systems. This is where we at Trace have invested past nine years to develop that comprehensive data platform so we can develop, so we can understand soil intelligence, decode it, and uh, take it to the real world for application. So uh, to give you a quick snapshot of what we do at Trace, uh, you know, we get a typical soil sample bag, we homogenize it, and from there, some of the soil goes to the chemistry and the carbon streamlines, and part of it goes to the microbiome analysis. And for microbiome, we do whole genome sequencing, we do the metagenome analysis. Then we bring in all the data points from these different streamlines together, uh, and I truly say it's in that data parallel computing is where the magic happens, which spits out a lot of this information on what is the status of the nature of the soils and how to manage these soils. Now, if we look at all the data that we generate using metagenome, um, now just to give you an insight into how we have developed the soil intelligence platform, as you know, at the base level, we have all those DNA sequences that come from the metagenome, and through that, we identify the organisms, the functions, the DNA properties characterizing the soils. And through this information, then we convert that into soil biology data, you know, as to what kind of pathogens you should be expecting, you know, what are the... Um, what is the ecosystem structure there? What are the nutrient cycling functions? And um, 
soil environmental functions. And once, and as we collect this data, you know, based on crop types, based on geographies, then we integrate a uh, context-based uh, knowledge uh, through statistics and modeling to then bring out those data insights to understand, you know, what is happening in the field, how do we manage that particular field? So there are all these different data layers that go in uh, and the and the information gets assimilated eventually into our results that we deliver to the customers. And again, uh, this might sound preaching like, like preaching to the core, but I would like to remind us here that, you know, we use metagenome sequencing. We do not do amplicon sequencing. And depending on whom you talk to, um, folks are going to say, anywhere less than one to 5% of the microbes truly on this planet have ever been identified, cultured and characterized, which is true. We know very little of uh, you know, what the microbes do, who they are and what they do. But what metagenome technologies like whole genome sequencing are enabling us is to look into the dark DNA matter and tell us what the potential is. I may not know who the microbe is, but as long as I know it has the genes for nitrogen fixation or phosphorus solubilization, we know that it has the potential you know, to deliver the function. So that, that is where the power and the strength of whole genome sequencing lies is because we can actually now sneak peek into that dark DNA matter and start to understand what that soil functions are. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly jump into uh, how we are mining this information and bringing value out. And the first category is nutrient use efficiency uh, I'm going to talk about. And in nutrient use efficiency, while there are you know a lot of different applications, the two things I'm going to touch upon today is phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, you know, going back to what uh, Dusty had said earlier, systems-based approach is going to be extremely important for us in answering questions. And that's what I call our trace fast system. It's actually a systems-based approach, approach uh, for phosphorus management. Now, if you step back and think about it, when we apply phosphorus to the soil, it's chemical molecule, right? It goes into the soil. What happens to that phosphorus? There's both chemistry in action and there's biology in action. The phosphorus can get bound up to different soil particles, uh, you know, to the clay particles out there, or they could be phosphorus just sitting in there, uh, which is soluble phosphorus. On the other hand, there are all these microbes in the soil. These microbes have the capability to release all that bound of phosphorus or microbes that can release the phosphorus from organic matter in the soil. Right. So truly to understand how to manage the phosphorus, we need to look at that chemistry aspect and the biology aspect. That's where in our trace phosphorus system, in our reports, uh, this is what a traditional report looks like. Um, we measure Bray, Olick, and, uh, Bray, Olson and Malik, all the three. But if you look at these uh, different bars, the first one is a saturation. What saturation tells us is how much of that soil is soaked up, how much of that sponge is empty or how much of that sponge is uh, is tied up. So on a scale of one to 100, you know, 50% of the soil is has phosphorus already tied up in it. That means there are 50% of the soil has empty pockets. So when we put the phosphorus fertilizer, some of it will get tied up into the soil. Now we know that. So based on that and based on the goal of the growers, you know, are they interested in build strategy? Are they interested in mining based on the phosphorus fertilizer rates and based on their budgets, that decision can be made as to what kind of products or how much phosphorus needs to go into that soil. On the other hand, we look at the biology as well and we say, what is the phosphorus solubilization potential and what is the mineralization potential? How can, what is the capability of the biology in my soil to actually mine the phosphorus that's already present in there or to protect the phosphorus to make it plant available and not get tied up into the soils? So this comprehensive system is now enabling our, our uh, customers to make those decisions on what kind of product should be placed on a given acre to get that uh, yield output. So from phosphorus, if I were to jump into nitrogen, we all understand nitrogen is a very complicated space, um, very complicated cycle. And I also call it as a very emotional space for everyone. Uh, it's such a key element for productivity that we've got to be very careful in understanding how to manage nitrogen. So what we're doing here uh, at Trace is 
all the nitrogen, no matter what form of nitrogen we put it into the soil, truly the fate of it is determined by the microbes. So we bring in all the nitrogen loss capabilities of the soil and the nitrogen gain uh, capabilities. In the nitrogen loss, we look at urea volatilization potential, nitrification and denitrification potentials that will enable our customers to figure out what kind of nit uh, nitrogen fertilizer forms they going to be putting in there and how are they going to be able to protect that you know where do you want to place a nitrification inhibitor or a use urease inhibitor to protect that nitrogen that you're putting on the farm making sure that the nitrogen is not going through leaching into our waterways or through greenhouse gas emissions but making it more plant available on the other hand looking at the biology and saying you know what is the capability of that microbiome to to do nitrogen fixation, either free living or symbiotic based on what crop types you're looking at and integrating that knowledge into the nitrogen management strategy and product placement on the acres. So that's where the trace N gives a very comprehensive, is a comprehensive tool to make the decision for placing products in the nitrogen space. So th that's a quick snapshot of how we can use metagenome data to manage nutrient use efficiency. I'm gonna shift gears here and talk about plant pathology. You know, um, I traditionally, I started with my career studying rice right, blast disease systems for my PhD. So, you know, pathogens always fascinate me. They're very close to my heart. Um, and I really got fascinated into the microbiome field truly because of disease suppressiveness. Uh, and so when I came to trace genomics four years ago, I've learned a lot more about the microbiome role in plant pathology. And I've also understood a lot of things about how plant diseases are perceived or measured or diagnosed in the field. Uh, and I understood that metagenome becomes a very powerful tool here. And I'll tell you why. Uh, I've put two instances here. So we've been charcoal rot. You know, we know pathogens move, right? And usually what happens is when it is when we end up in crop losses, we go and figure out, okay, we have a new pathogen, we need to manage for it. But here with metagenomics, you know, when we for when we analyze the soil sample from North Dakota, the we identified charcoal rot. So we've been charcoal rot in this field. And the customers, the growers came and said, We never had charcoal rot in this field. It does not exist in our region. We said, well, that's the DNA and we're very sure about this. So they went to the extension offices at NDSU and they got it tested and lo and behold, they did have charcoal rot. So now this becomes a tool to start identifying when pathogens are moving into areas and diagnose it properly. The other common thing that happens in plant pathology is misdiagnosis. If you think about it, a lot of fungal pathogens look very similar. So here's a case of soybean, soybean stem canker. When we identified that the problem in this particular field was diaporthy, the customer said, no, they had a different fungal pathogen history. It was, uh, and they were managing for this other fungal pathogen. And we said, well, this is what the data shows. Again, they went to University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension Labs, and then they tested it. And they did say that it is actually diaporthy because the, the features, you know, the disease symptoms looked very similar to this other pathogen that they were used to in that particular field. So now our customers are able to make the right decisions because we're able to diagnose either ahead of time or right diagnosis. And what becomes very important when we talk about diseases is the precision and the accuracy of identifying these microbes at the species level, because we know several of the diseases are very species specific uh, for crops. So early on, when we started phrase genomics, we actually compared our platform to droplet digital PCR platform, because by far that is the most sensitive platform for microbe identification. And we figured out that we match pretty well on this platform. You know, our platform and a pipeline matches pretty well with Droplet Digital PCR. And we really take pride at Trace Genomics because we have established pipelines. We have worked with USDA, AFIS, PPQ department scientists, and they now accept our reports for microbe identification for presence and prevalence of microbes to give regulatory uh, regulatory permits for biological companies to do their field trials or to bring their product to the market. And for for these um, for this department to do that, the false positive rates have to be less than one percent. And Trace platform meets that particular criteria. So when we put out a report about you know identifying pathogens in the field, we are very confident because when in doubt, we don't report. So uh, this is about um, uh, 
fungal and bacterial pathogens, when we moved into nematodes, uh, we wanted to explore the potential of the platform for nematodes. And soybean cyst nematode uh, is a big problem. And the traditional method is egg pounds takes a very long time with a high error margin. So we explored and we did a validation study between our platform and the standard egg pounds with Iowa State University at Greg Telka's lab. And what we identified was every time the eggs were present in their reports, we found the eggs where the signature was present in our platform. When the eggs were absent in the soil samples, we did not find a signal in there. There were some samples where there was no signal, there was no eggs in the egg count methods, but we still found a signal in here. And that usually happens because um, in egg counts, they're only looking for eggs visually, but in our method, we look for any kind of DNA. There could be nematodes, some dead DNA, some dead soil matter with some nematode, dead nematode DNA sticking in there from the juveniles or the adults. And we capture all that signal because we're not looking just for eggs. But then we did these studies over a couple of years and we added, and we figured out that that metagenomic technology is really good even to extend this to uh, nematodes and even beetles. We do even corn root worm. Uh, I'm not showing that study here right now, but uh, we, have extend, we are extending our uh, capabilities on reporting for plant diseases. So a typical report looks like this. The, a grower can pick and choose uh, the, con, the crop type that they're interested in and the top six pathogens that are of concern to them because the kind of pathogens uh, vary from region to region and we benchmark it so that you know they understand what the risk is. What these reports are now enabling our customers to do is pick the right kind of um, germplasms for seed selections. They're now able to put the right kind of crop protection, seed treatments. They're even able to make the right kind of in-season uh, fungicide placements and treatments. Um, and at this point, what I would probably quickly do is share a couple instances where, you know, uh, this was a case with a retail agronomist in Illinois, went to his grower with this report and said, hey, you have a lot of anthracnose in your fields. You should look for an anthracnose resistance corn hybrid that this particular year. And the customer never knew that he had anthracnose, was very skeptical about it and said, no, I'm going to go with my high yielding variety. So they decided that they're going to do a side by side trial. And lo and behold, the anthracnose resistant corn hybrid gave 32 bushels per acre increased yield. And that was the first time that the grower even understood that anthracnose was causing a yield drag in his fields. Similarly, we have several instances. Another instance that I put out here, I think, is soybean cyst nematode, where, you know, when decisions were made based on our reports, uh, on these reporting, you know, there was uh, better disease management and increased yield in their fields. So that's how we, we bring this metagenome knowledge, uh, whether it's pathogens or mutant cycling or other soil functions, which I don't have time to elaborate today for soil amendment tools and soil health, that, you know, we are using this knowledge. Now, some of the common questions we get is, well, soil microbe is so variable, microbiome, you know, how are you capturing the variability? Is that myth or reality? How do I soil sample? How, you know, if I, you know, you know, I'm capturing all the features in the soil when I, you know, send one or two soil samples to through trace genomics. A very valid question, and we had to investigate this as well. So, over the years, we have done a lot of studies to understand how soil microbiome behaves, how variable is it, how diverse it is. And my quick answer to this is both of them are true. It is variable and it is not variable because it talk because it's all about what kind of microbiome you're talking about. And I say that, now I want to talk about this one particular study we have done, um, corn belt across seven different states. We took the soils and we analyzed them. When you look at the taxonomic profile, several of them group distinctly around, indicating that they're very diverse, okay? But then when you go to the functional profiles, now this is where the power comes of metagenome, metagenome because we're not just looking at who is in there, we're looking at gene profiles and what functions do they do in the soil. If you look at that extensive functional profiling, the variability then collapses in the corn fields across different states. So depending on, and from an agronomic perspective, what's really important is the different functions that are important for us to meet our agricultural goals, right? Now, if I were to take the same functional profile from a corn field and compare it to, uh, let's say somewhere in Arizona in the leafy greens, it will be different. So 
when you're talking about diversity, we really have to understand the context and what kind of diversity we're talking about to figure out how to apply that in into the real world. So, but this is one time point snapshot. You know, the other question that we have asked and our, our customers have asked is, how do we know what is the right time to soil sample, you know? Season changes happen, environmental changes happen, year over year things change. How do we understand? So what we did was we actually collaborated uh, with, consulted and collaborated with scientists, uh, with professors at universities, commercial agronomists and growers and designed a 24 month study. At some point, I hope to bring this to publication when I have more bandwidth, but we went into these soil in three different regions, Texas, Iowa, and California, very different cropping systems, very different management styles. And every four weeks, we, we profile the soil samples. And we got this very rich data set now that now enabled us to understand how microbiome varies, when it varies based on crop types and based on geographies. I'll give you a couple of quick instances here. Uh, if you look at this graph on the top, this is a nitrogen use efficiency indicator, one of the features in, the, in that particular nitrogen cycle. If you look at the variation throughout the year and year over year, you see the patterns remain very similar, except in year one, in the summer months, the pattern shifted. That is because it was very severe drought in year one. And truly because of that, we said we'll do a year two study in all these three states. If you look at the pathogens, you know, we this is at the genus level looking at pythium, which is a necrotroph. Um, it's in fall season, you know, harvest, getting close to harvest, and in fall season is when these pathogen populations increase. And then freeze comes, you know, they go down. The missing time points here is because the ground was so frozen, we couldn't even drill into the soil. So we didn't, we missed those time points. But then you see the patterns. Now we understand different kinds of pathogens, different cropping systems, how they behave. We take this information and knowledge and integrate it into our data delivery, our results delivery, and our recommendations to our customers. You know, so, um, you know, so we can account for variability, we can account for the right way of sampling to make those decisions. Uh, the other question that, you know, especially in the last couple of years with all the challenges that we're having and the push to move away from chemicals uh, to more bio-based, nature-based solutions, you know, the question is, can we enhance the win rate of the biological products using metagenome? Um, and as we said earlier, you know, somewhere around 1880s is when the first bio nematicides and biopesticides came into the market, the biocontrol strategy came through. If you look at it, it's uh, what, around over 40 years, and we haven't seen the adoption uh, happen. You know, we haven't reached the tipping point for it to penetrate. And the reason is because n number of surveys that have been done, they always say there is lack of trust in product performance. And I feel that's for the right reason, because we've been looking always at a biological product performance, like a chemical product performance. We need to accept the fact that a biological or a biostimulant is not going to work equally on every acre. So how do we develop that soil intelligence to understand where to place the product and how to place the product? So trace genomics have been working in this particular area for the past three years. And we've made, we've gained a lot of understanding in this space. And I'm going to give you uh, one example here. We did a field trial uh, that was conducted in corn fields across, I think, uh, six different states in the Midwest. Uh, the product was biostimulant and furrow application, and the product function was enhanced phosphorus use efficiency. Now, the findings, what we figured out was that across the regions, now, when we collected the data, we looked at the baselines pre-planting. And after planting within a month, we got the rhizosphere microbiome for all the soils and started to see where which soils is the rhizosphere even responding to the product application because the rhizosphere microbiome is critical for translating uh, the function into the plant. And then at the end of the year, we got the yield data. And when we overlaid it, what we realized is a gain in the yield potential corresponded to the regions where the rhizosphere microbiome really responded positively. So we said, okay, what is it in these baseline soils where in the states where there was a response, what were the features that really enabled this product to respond? So then we looked into the microbiome of the baseline soils, into the functional biome, and we said, started identifying features, now understanding what kind of soils does this product really perform? 
which acre do you need to put this product on to get that response? So this is the approach that we've been taking at Trace Genomics to develop the frameworks for product placement. We still have a long journey to go through, but uh, I think we're learning um, as we move along this particular journey. Now, another, the other question that we keep, keep getting asked is soil health, right? And soil health, I think the definition of soil health is very cultural, depending on your culture, depending on your cropping systems, the definition is very different. And I say soil health definition is very complicated because depending on whom you talk to, it can get very philosophical. But if I were to think, if I were to be a grower, which I am not, but if I were to think like a grower, the first thing that comes to my mind is I would call my soil healthy if it is going to be a good yielding soil with minimum inputs, has the res resilience against biotic and abiotic stresses. Very broad definition. And if I were to say, what are the functions of the soil that's going to enhance my yield and you know be resilient? It would be that uh, biodiversity. It would be the capability of the microbes to provide nutrients to the plant, the capability of the soils to give resilience to disease, Capability of the soils for uh, abiotic stresses, you know, carbon sequestration, all these functions. So based on some of these functions, we've developed what's called as a soil resilience score. These are very pilot programs that we have right now that we're evolving this technology. So one of some of our, we have this common understanding that we go through conventional tillage, we really hurt soil health uh, and no till systems are better. So one of our customers really wanted to test that and see, can microbiome really help us understand this one? So here's a case study where we did year over year studies with them. They sent us samples blindfolded. We had no idea which ones came from which management practices. All we knew were they were coming from different management practices. And what we figured out is in the conventional till, and you know, after we did the results delivery to them, they came and told us that which one was which management practice, we realized that in the conventional till, the soil resilience really dropped. In the no-till, it remained same or started getting a little better. And when we do a deep, when we did a deeper dive into the conventional till system, you know, what we would expect is in conventional till, it breaks the soil structure, the microbiome diversity goes away, the carbon capability to hold carbon goes away. And those were the features that were impacted. So now this microbiome not only tells us which systems work better, but it also tells us which functions are missing so that when our customers invest the dollars to build their soils, they know which functions they need to build on, what kind of decisions or inputs need to go into that farm. So truly, this is a tool, uh, a long-term tool to build healthier soils and to improve resilience in our systems, agricultural systems. With those case studies, uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I'd like to just go through the conclusions and I'd say, as I said in the title, soil metagenome data is truly evolving to be a frontier in sustainable agriculture. It's a great tool to place the right product on the right acre, to enhance the win rate and give that most coveted ROI to the growers. And this data layer, metagenome data, is going to be really important for us to revert soil degradation to build healthier soils and to build very resilient agricultural systems. However, I will add that we are just now scratching the surface. It's a long journey for us to go through and it's gonna be really important for us to enhance this knowledge base and that's gonna be possible with transdisciplinary collaborations. So really looking forward to see you know, the advancements in this field and to be able to translate that knowledge at the farm gate so our growers can benefit uh, from this knowledge. With that, I would like to thank uh, you know, a lot of different members. Uh, just to start off with the TRACE team, I think we've been blessed to have incredible scientists over the past nine years. A lot of the past and the current team members, you know, kudos to them who have evolved this knowledge and the science to where we are today. Um, really thankful to all the past and the present Trace Agronomy Network members, the scientific advisors and the industry advisors, which encompasses scientists from all the way from, so you say, industry, from USDA, from academia, who constantly guide us in the, in the right direction. Uh, of course, our association with International Phytobiomes Alliance, it's been a great association. I've learned a great deal uh, uh, in our conversations here, and we have constantly received uh, amazing support from this group.
Last but not the least, the most important group that I'd like to thank is our customers without whom we wouldn't have been here where we are. With that, I would like to close this and open it up for questions. Great, thank you, Persona, for a great presentation. And we have a number of questions coming in. And so I would like to just remind our participants that um, you have the ability to look at all of the questions that have been posted in the Q&A function. And there is a, an up, upvote feature <clears throat> that if you see a question that you really want uh, to be answered live here on this webinar and then um, use that up feature. It's the thumbs up that is at the bottom left hand corner of um, each question that has been asked. So um, and and we do have a number of questions that have received votes. Um, so um, let's get started, Krishnana. So our first question is um, for indigeneity reports for APHIS reporting. How does trace genomic platforms assess the taxon taxonomy of a given microbe? Example, ex for example, 16S, multi-locus gene alignment, ANI, et cetera. Um, so actually, at trace genomics, we do whole genome sequencing of every soil sample, every single soil sample that comes in for biology analysis. So we do not do amplicon sequencing. We look at the whole genome sequencing and use the whole genome sequences to do the searches for the microbes. And so how do you, um, and so does that flow well into the reports for APHIS? Yes, yes, okay. for APHIS. So what we've done is over a span of four to six months when we started this work with our first customer, uh, you know, this technology was very new for APHIS scientists, because uh, we met with like five or six of their team members, their scientists. Uh, and they it, it was amazing because, you know, they were so open. They understand that moving forward, metagenome will be the technology that will be used. They are very familiar with droplet digital PCR and moving into amplicon sequencing. They're very familiar with that. They understand how to assess the false positive rates there. So what we did is we worked with, uh, with them to educate them about our pipeline about our um, about our metrics, about how we do the evaluations of the sequences, uh, the how we reduce the false positive rates in our system. And we have done a lot of uh, almost R&D like work showing them the comparison of the trace platform and how it, how some of their findings from the other, st other studies translated. For example, there was this big list of uh, uh, very prevalent microbes and non-prevalent microbes uh, that USDA had published in the past. We analyzed that and we showed them on the trace platform how it translates so that they understand the language of the metagenome platform. And uh, then they had suggestions about some of the different kinds of analysis we should be doing for them to make the decision. So it was a back and forth uh, process, learning process for us and for them over four months. And through that process, we've evolved a pipeline and the report formats so that now the scientists there understand when trees gives out a report, how to assess what is the false positive rate and how to make the decision based on that. So it was a uh, it was an it was a very good journey that you know that we did along with the AFS uh, to evolve these pipelines for analysis. Okay, great, thank you. So our next question is, what impact do soil properties have on the accuracy and reliability of metagenomic results? Let me say, can you repeat that one more time? Yes, what impact do soil properties have on the accuracy and reliability of metagenomic results? Okay. Uh, it depends on what kind of soil properties we're talking about. Based on, you know, different textured soils will have different kinds of microbiome profiles. Different crop types will have different kinds of microbiome properties. When we talk about the accuracy, um, you know, through the presentation, I've, I've talked about how we have evolved our pipeline to be very accurate when we report microbes, right? Uh, which is taxonomy based at the species level. 
Now, when we talk about the gene-based functions, let's say, for example, let's pick up phosphosolubilization, okay? What we do there is we look at the genes that are involved in the phosphosolubilization process in the soil, and we mine that out, and we, we assess what is the phosphosolubilization potential. So what we have done is over the years, we have done a lot of studies, again, in collaboration with our customers, to see how these particular functions vary based on cropping systems, based on geographies, and based on seasonal variations. We have also assessed how these functional properties change based on your inputs. Let's say you have a manured farm versus a non-manured farm. We understand how these indicators move, and we have done studies to validate that. You know, when we say we ha you have a high phosphosolubilization potential, and you have a high phosphorus saturation ratio in the phosphorus saturation values. We had one of our customers who did not put any phosphorus fertilizer in there, literally zero phosphorus fertilizer. There was a hog farm around the corner. He just put, put some hog manure. Phosphorus solubilization and mineralization just went high, had the best yielding soybean he had on that farm. So we have done actually some, some of these ground crew things to validate and see and understand how these different functions, you know, evolve and move based on the management practices. So the accuracy depends on uh, the contextual knowledge of agronomy there that we integrate uh, when we talk to our customers. Thank you. Okay, how well does the genetic potential of the microbe actually correlate with the activity? I love that someone has asked this question. I was hoping someone would ask this question. Who did that? Thank you. And I'm sure that's a question in a lot of the minds. Yes. Uh, you know, the early years I came to Trace Genomics, I said at some point I want to establish a metatranscriptomics pipeline. We're not there, but uh, uh, that's a very important question. What we have done is uh, over the years, both within the lab and at the field level, we want we have been working on understanding how that potential translates into activity. For example, urease, uh, urea volatilization potential, essentially the urease activity. We have brought, we have assessed the soils with the urease potential based on the microbiome, the urea volatilization potential, and we have done the urease activity in the soils. We have done the testing in the soils, and we have seen the different soils have different rates at which, you know, the urease activity was happening in soil. So we use that to kind of calibrate the actual functions, but we do have to remember that this is a potential the weather has to be ideal for denitrification to happen. It has to have that kind of environment. When that environment is there is when the activity actually happens. We have tested the same thing for phosphorus saturation ratios, looking at the water-soluble uh, phosphorus values as R&D in in-house, the in, in -house, and what chemistry, soil chemistry, impacts those functions. Similarly, phosphorus solubilization which factors actually translate that into an action in the field. So we have been validating uh, different indicators differently because you know they, they function very differently. So we've been generating these data sets to understand when and where do they translate into activity. Thank you. The next question is, is one that I have myself. Can you describe the soil sampling methodology? And is this something done by the farmer? Um, do you hire a consultant or does tr do trace employees do it? Go to the field. Okay, no, trace employees don't do this. It's not practical for the trace employees to, to go to these farms. Um, so we do a lot of our customers is through retail agronomy. We do have some large growers, uh, but most of our customers are through retail agronomy. And they, did, they, they, work, they work with the growers and uh, we incorporate, we meet the growers where they are truly. We meet our customers where they are. So we take their soil sampling strategy that they do for chemistry. So some of them are grid-based, some of them are zone-based. We bring in the standard one pound of soil, bring it into the lab as it's shown in one of those earlier slides. We get a standard soil uh, bag, a pound of soil, which we then take through both chemistry and biology. So it's, it's standard cores, you know, uh, 10 to 12 cores, zero to six inches. But again, if you're talking about certain regions, they go to eight inches. Other regions like California go to 12 inches. So whatever is their standard practice for chemistry, we integrate it into that because 
truly it's logistics that determines everything, right? Um, you know, logistics have to meet agronomy for anything to be successful here. And so uh, we we meet where we meet them where they are, and uh, we bring in that typical standard pound of soil. Uh, recommended is at least zero to six inches. Okay. Thank you. Do the high due to the high abundance and diversity of microorganisms in soil systems, are you able to recover all that diversity? Are you able to close genomes with your pipeline? Which is the sequencing depth effort needed to do metagenomics in soil? That's, that's a very, a lot. That's yeah, a lot. That's, and, and that's, that's a very relevant question. That's a very relevant let, question. Let me know if you need any of that repeated at any time. Um, I think I captured most of it. Um, okay. So the sequencing depth. Uh, I think we've done several studies, uh, a few studies in house, and a lot of studies that have been done and uh, uh, that I've that I'd seen and reviewed. Where, yes, based on the deeper we go into the sequencing uh, depths the more the biodiversity and the, the microbial profiles that we capture. Absolutely, yes. But what we have also seen is whether we start at um, one gigabyte compared to 100 gigabytes of data that's generated from the same soil sample, the ones that are in high abundance at one gigabyte are still the ones that are high abundant at, at 100 gigabytes in that particular sample. The ones that are lower diversity that, you know, rare microbes are the ones that start to show up as you go to like 10 gigabytes or 30 gigabytes or 50 gigabytes. Now, yes, that happens. But what we are trying to do here is we are trying to take this metagenome knowledge to convert it at the farm gate to make decisions. Now, all if if I'm a corn grower and I'm making a decision or whether I'm a, you know, whatever crop that I'm trying to grow and I'm trying to take a, make a decision on my nutrient use efficiency. What I'm putting in there is I'm putting in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, the micros and the macros, right? So if I talk about nitrogen fertilizer use efficiency, what are the processes in the soil that impact nitrogen use efficiency, right? We're looking at the gene level uh, and because we're looking at the, you know, all these genes there, we are able to come up with the potential of that specific function. And what we've realized in our, now we have around 35, 35,000 plus soil samples just within the United States in our database, you know, with a lot of diversity in there. And we are now starting to identify patterns as to how these functions behave based on crops and based on geographies. Now that is a lot more valuable in terms of an actionable insight at the farm gate. So we do uh, truly, you know, our metagenome sequencing, what I call is shallow metagenome sequencing. The reason we don't do deeper as much as I would love to do it is it gets too expensive for the grower, right? And when the sequencing prices are going to go down as technology is going to evolve, we are going to go deeper and deeper. But where we are with our metagenome uh, depth that we're doing right now, we are able to understand at the depth that we're doing how these functions are moving over time, how these functions are shifting based on crop crop types and geographies, which is the knowledge that we're now translating it to our farmers and to our growers. Now, did that capture all the questions that were asked in that disty? I think I think so. I think you did a great job. And um, we, we have only a couple of minutes left. So let's get to maybe the, the last question that we will be answering live and that Prasanna has agreed to um, provide written responses to the questions that we're not able to get to today. So um, our final question um, of the day is, what is the nitrogen use efficiency indicator that you used? What is the nitrogen? Oh, in that in that particular graph, it is, um, let me try to recall. I think it's, it's one of the nitrogen loss indicators. Uh, don't remember, it, it's either denitrification or nitrification or one of those. But I know it's definitely one of the uh, ni uh, nitrogen loss indicator, you know, processes by which you would lose a form of nitrogen in the soil. Okay. Um, actually, we may have time for just one additional question. Um, are there specific microbial communities that can serve as indicators for optimal application timing and frequency of biological products? Um, I don't think there's one magic bullet that serves everything. 
Um, even as we speak here today, I have several experiments that are running both in the greenhouse and the field uh, for different categories of products to understand, uh, you know, that particular product placement. And what we're seeing is that there are these additional microbiome functions. You know, my product, my biological product may do X function, but for that X function, for that microbe to establish and deliver its, its uh, function, we're seeing that there needs to be this additional supporting functions that the native micro microbiome will have to provide. And uh, as I said, you know, we are we are starting to identify these features, but it varies completely from product to product. What we have also seen is that you take, for example, bacillus amylolipase. So I'll take that as an example. Phosphorus solubilizing micro. If you change the formulation, its performance differed. And we've taken the same product. We've verified the purity absolutely pure. We put it with different starters because that's how the tank mixes happen. You know, trying to simulate what happens in the growers' field. And depending on the starter that we put in there, the performance varied again. Then we took a particular starter combination. We took that soil, we took that product, and we put it into soils from different states. The performance varied. Now, through all of that stuff, we look through what are some of the common features that we should be expecting for this product. And then develop the framework to see in which kind of soils, what are these soils when it performs really well? What are these additional features in the soil that is supporting it? Two things that it is allowing our customers to do. Number one is to figure out, just based on the soil test, understand where to place the product. Number two, for the biological product companies to understand what are the features in the soil when it's working. So to develop their next version of the product, you know, with this combined feature so that, you know, then they can uh, come up with uh, products that can be placed in different kinds of acres. We always have to remember a particular product, a particular formulation, a particular strain will not work in all environments. It will not. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Prasanna, for being here and providing an excellent um, presentation and then uh, discussion um, and answering all of these questions. We want to thank all of our participants for joining and submitting questions. And uh, please stay tuned for uh, additional information about our next webinar, which will be in December. So thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, Dusty, and thanks to all the viewers have come in here um, and I really enjoyed answering those questions. Thank you all again. Thank you.